this is pretty much going to be an overview regarding campaign communications. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about like framing and everything else, but other things regarding campaign communications. Um, I'm pretty much going to do an overview. A lot of folks in here know this and those who are candidates, if you have questions, um, please ask away. Um, and when I talk about campaign communications also, I'm not just focusing just on the electoral side of things. I'm also focusing on the organ organizi organizing side of things also, because I do feel they do overlap in some ways, even though they have two different aims when it comes to um, their respective categories. So, ooh. so for those who may know, you know my name's AJ use they, them pronouns, been in the party for a while. Um, most of my education and training in politics and organizing has been around strategic communication to one degree or another. Um, served in communication roles within the Green Party in various campaigns, as well as in organizations in the Green Party, as well as various community organizations, coalitions, and activist groups around the Midwest. Um, so like I said, we're going to talk about the, the importance of it and the ways we to communicate um, in, in our in our respective campaigns are the two things we're going to be talking about here. So why is this important when we talk about campaign communications? Well, it's, it's a way to convey our, our campaign aims to our constituents and the greater public. Uh, that's what it is at the end of the day. You know, how are we as candidates, as a Green Party organization, or as a community organization, activist groups, how are we conveying the aims of our campaigns to our supporters, to our potential supporters, as well as folks that we're trying to sway to come to our side? Um, that's what we're trying to do here. And there are some effective ways of doing that, you know, and the way we communicate in our campaign is going to be a make or break on how effective the community, the campaign is going to go through communications. So there's, there's these three things. We got to know the media landscape. So I'll talk about the paid and earn, earn side of media. Uh, this is the part I'm going to be settling on the most, which is framing the campaign. You know, what are you saying about yourself, about the issues and about the opponents? You know, so the framing is very crucial when it comes to this. And then who are we reaching out to? What's the efficiency plan um, in order to reduce the broad reach and everything? So these are the three things. So we're going to talk, talk about the middle portion, which is framing. One thing I have noticed in third parties and as well as other um, organizing campaigns is that it's we there's sometimes a hard time to understand it's the battle in communication is the interpretation of the of what the message is so the battle is about how we're interpreting this and we kind of saw this during you know the last president and the reactionaries of, of this, you know? And we, we started seeing this battle. It's a little bit more glaring, I would say, than in, in previous moments when we're talking about framing issues and everything. So like th these are six essential things. Um, most of these things have come from um, George Lakoff, who is a, a cognitive scientist and talks a lot about framing. Um, as well as uh, various other folks I have learned over the years as well when talking about framing. So we have to understand when it comes to framing that every word invokes a frame. And that frame creates an image in our minds. You know, are there metaphors? Are there catchphrases? Are there anecdotes? All of those carry a frame. So George Lakoff wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant. And that's the first thing he starts off in his lecture at UCLA, don't think of an elephant because we can't. If you say the word elephant, we know what we're thinking about. Big ears, maybe tusks, a trunk, you know, some sort of caricature of what an elephant looks like. Um, 
so th that has that has a meaning of it and everything that we say when it comes to campaigns every word that we're talking about on issues that ev evokes a frame so it's a question of how are we using that to our advantage to get our supporters to really support us and how do we sway folks to come to our side uh, most people don't join a campaign because of facts figures and logic and that's, I feel, we do a default a lot of, is we say, you know what? I got numbers. I have this document this thick with resources and information. Here's the answers. But it's not going to win at the end of the day. It just isn't. I can show everyone why a LaSalle tax is important. I can show them why it's important for us to have a LaSalle tax. But that is not going to win folks over. We have to invoke some sort of emotion that's going to be a motivator by them. And we're talking about these emotions. We're talking about fear, love, and empowerment. You know, those are essentially the three things that folks are motivated by. Fear, love, and empowerment. And so how are we going to appeal that common values of our audience when we're conveying why the problem exists? How does that how does this problem impact um, various communities? And what are the solutions in terms of, you know, how the audience is going to get involved? So those are the things that are important also. So when we're conveying in our communities, when we're out in the public, how are we appealing to folks? How are we addressing that? in a way that impacts them. And then solutions in terms of how do we get in, in audiences involved? I am fighting for this because, and this is why you need to get involved. And here's ways you can get involved. And the thing we, we need to learn, and I've noticed this, and I've said this from time to time, is that, uh, we need to take, we need to look at what the conservatives are doing at their playbook because they know how to frame issues. And I think as much of there's a lot to say about conservatives in terms of why they're bad and the things they're doing and what have you. But they're the ones who know how to polarize an issue really well. And so instead of saying, you know what, that's not my bag. And again, we default to that logic, we default to facts and figures. We default to that, but I think a better thing we should be thinking about is how are they winning? What are the ways that they're winning on reproductive rights? How are they winning when it comes to financial things? How are they winning on whatever the thing is? It's about the framing. They've taken 40 years, 40 years in order to get this right. They have intellectuals through their think tanks to help them out in order to craft the kind of messaging through the Heritage Foundation and um, Cato Institute and uh, Mitch McConnell has his institute down University of Louisville and everything. Uh, they have folks doing this for them. And this is how they win. So from there, we have to talk about like reframing because reframing is telling the truth of what we are seeing. And the truth will not set alone, but it, it's how it's framed. If we frame it correctly and that truth is presented to itself is when folks are gonna can't come on board. And we have to think that frames, it forms a system and that system has to be built over time. Again, it goes back to what you said. Conservatives have done little over 40 years of this. They've created a system, and it's a system still works. We can't talk about tax relief because George W. Bush and all them, since the first time around, uh, says, you know, people need tax relief. And, it, and, and they won for them with George W. Bush when he got elected in office. So, we, 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 so when we're talking about framing, these are the components that we need to start thinking about. And, and I will share, I have different articles of, um, of all the stuff 
that I'm anyone wants to have them, please, please let me know and I will get them to you. Um, so um, really briefly, um, uh, Vijeta Prashad, um, he's a, a historian and a, com and a commentator, mostly about South, South Asian history, um, written many books about it but the what how i came into with him is he talked about in an interview of this idea of uh, um socialist writing not like socialist writers or all that but like how to like write in a, in a very socialist way um and this is what he's kind of talking about here writing while socialist was, was that uh, it was an essay um and I, it's, it's throughout other places, but it, here's like some of the highlights of what he's talking about here. Um, that when we were talking about campaign uh, messaging, especially when we were write op-eds or when we write essays, uh, we need to take lead from peoples in the struggle because we have to understand that when we're running campaigns, even as candidates, we're doing it. We're doing it through a spectacle, right? Um, the, the media likes a spectacle called electoral campaigns because they just want to see the candidates, you know. And they'll do the debates, they'll do forums and all that, and they'll be there. Newspapers will be there, but as Steve mentioned, you know, there's a blackout <clears throat> with third parties and everything, and that's something that we do need to think about and why. There is such a blackout and how do we can come out of that but with that said the media will, will come to candidates and talk about them but we have to talk about people because as much as that we're trying to run for an office we are also need to be working with constituents so we need to take lead from folks of their struggles and how do we convey that how we're not just a conduit, as Prashad says, you know, um, we are taking lived stories, lived experiences of the worker who is trying to fight for a living wage. So we are fighting for the teacher who is getting paid very low and is their funding is being decreased over the years by a school board. Uh, we have an area of Chicago that still has food deserts. So how do we convey these lived experiences through this vehicle that we call political campaigns? And we're not just spectators, we're just pushing something forward. You know, we cannot spectate and just observe and just say anything. We, how are we using ourselves to push something forward? And again, all of us are made up of stories. Every single one of us have a story and, and I wish I could write a book about every single folks in Illinois Green Party because it is a rich history. Um, and this is the time of things we need to think about too. Like how can we push these stories forward? And then what is the thought behind the text? Because as Prashad says, you know, sending a tweet out is, can be thoughtless. 140 words, you know, oh, it can be just that, even an essay. A long essay can be just thoughtless. What are we writing about? When we write op-eds, what are we really writing about? I was, I'll was i even go as far as say, what are we talking about when we're being interviewed? What are we talking about when we're at debates and forums? There has to be something behind that other than just talking points. And then this is something a lot of you know candidates and even organizers need to think about with campaigning. It's just what's called a Tully box. It was a, a candidate early 2000s named Tully. I believe it was in Pennsylvania. This is just a, a comparison matrix of, you know, yourself as a candidate or a campaign as well as the opposition. So it's this matrix of, you know, what are you saying about the campaign? What is the opposing campaign saying about it um and what other people are saying about us you know so we, we got to think about these comparisons 
and how we can start crafting um, a communication plan a little bit more strategic from this matrix and everything. Okay, so that was framing. I'm going to highlight some points here. Again, we're going to know our, land, our media landscape. There's paid media and there's earned media, all right? Paid media means that we're, that we're controlling the message at this point. Um, it, it can be paid media in terms of social media, like the Facebook ads and, and things of that nature. Um, th there's that. So you actually, there's some sort of transactional thing happening. There's that kind of paid media. Um, even newspaper advertisements, um, billboards, um, things of that nature. So that's the messages that we're controlling. And then there's a whole formula like, you know, what's that return on investment, that ROI, when we're putting yard signs out or when we're putting up a, a billboard up and everything, you know, X amount of money and how many voters are we going to get um, through that means and everything. Um, and then the earned media is, you know, is that free media when we are persuading the news, the value of the campaign. The media won't come to us unless it's persuaded by them of what's the news value. So just saying that, you know, we're just disgruntled because of election law, they're not going to care. What is the value for them? We know it's a value. We know it's important. But at the end of the day, the news media, um, they just don't care. And especially how, you know, news outlets are operated these days. You know, there's no real investigative journalism anymore. So we need to persuade them that what is the news value? Why is a township um, not following the letter of the law when it comes to maybe a, maybe a township issue? Um, why, um, the Cook County, I'm, I'm pulling something way back here now. Why is the Cook County office, you know, misspelled a candidate's last name that happened to be in certain black and brown wards in, uh, the city of Chicago and everything, you know, what was that news value for them? So this one we're talking about the earned media side. So this is the Illinois market, primarily for television. The same could be said for um, radio as well. Um, so just to highlight here, you know, this is like the reach of Chicago from Cook County and dumps into, you know, the surrounding co counties as well as, you know, just to Rockford and almost by my way over by Whiteside County and everything. Um, so like we can kind of tell through this media market, the reach of folks. But this is important to know, if we're running a campaign, even a statewide campaign, let's say, we have to understand the efficiency when we're doing these campaigns. So instead of doing all over up and down the state of Illinois, you know, what is the most efficiency way of a campaign out? Is it just a Chicago media market? Is it just the St. Louis market? Is it just the Central Illinois market? What's that market? You know, what is the going to give us the best um, response when it comes to constituents um, in terms of a statewide campaign? At a local campaign, you know, what's going to be the outlet that's going to be targeted the most? And I can talk with anyone about more of a localized media markets and how to kind of conceptualize that. So that's the media market. So press releases, you know, is designed a journalistic document regarding the campaign. Um, this is an example of a, a press release that I done with the Chicago Alliance Against Race and Public Repression um, through their stop police crimes campaign I was on with them. And if you can kind of see, this is how it's usually devised, you know, with the contact information, you know, and the title, and then this is the document, you know, there's quotes that I took, I've taken from, from people on the committee, um, presented information in it, and I wrote in a very journalistic way, um, always wrote, written in a third person style way. And this is how the Tribune printed it. 
they again we don't have journalists who like well you send a press release out you get a, a phone or an email you have a back and forth and then they do an article you write it up they'll print it this has been 95 percent of the time that's happened with me where i've sent press releases out and the papers is printed as it's written and everything um and then you can have references like i have in the bottom here and then more information about the campaign and everything so this is just uh that when it comes to the press releases excuse me oh I, this is the one thing I didn't let me mention one more thing. So there's also something called a media advisory. It's a little bit different than this. And an advisory is just let you know what you're doing in a media event, um, whether you're going to be out in public somewhere or there's a debate, anything like that. So this is pretty much you're talking about the who, what, when, where, and why, and how um, questions on the media advisory. So that's a very brief document um, that you also send out to the media. So media events, um, news conferences are where you show off the campaign, you know, um, bringing the media in a very controlled environment is what these are. Uh, this is Lee Allen Jones. Some of us may know who Lee Allen Jones is or was. Um, he was our senatorial camp, camp candidate as well as running that special second um, congressional district also. As a Green Party candidate, well, I was his advisor for his Senate, Senate campaign, and, and I bring him up for a reason. So again, the camp news conferences are about showing off the campaign. When he was running for Senate, we, I was trying to get him out to Rockford when he ran at the time, because Rockford had an unemployment rate around 30%, near 30% at the time, the highest one in the state of Illinois. And he wanted to address that. And so he wanted to go to the east side of Rockford which makes sense because it's a lot of people on the east side of Rockford trying to get more close to City Hall, something like that. And I said, no, let's go to the west side. And I showed him the west side of this abandoned factory that used to be <clears throat> a major employer of Rockford at the time. And it shut down because of globalization and everything. It, it, it closed it all down, laid off a whole bunch of people, and the building sat there. I said, we need to have this in the backdrop. You need to be talking about this in your own way. And this is what we need to go on everything. And, and, and we did that. We bring the media out in a very controlled environment, whether it's like indoor space, uh, Lee Allen speaking at the Metropolitan, I believe it's called the Metropolitan Planning Council down in St. Louis, East St. Louis, and that one. So that's in a room, but outside, you know, again, framing words and votes frames, but even our the, the actual environment in votes and frames. So having an abandoned factory in the background to show why does unemployment at the city of Rockford is not addressing. And someone, Lee Allen, who's seen this firsthand in the south side of Chicago can bridge those things. So this is the kind of things we need to how we can control um the media environment and everything another example this is the el milagro workers down in pilsen uh they brought media to pilsen they brought media in front of the factory of why they are striking down there so this is the they're framing the message also to saying this is why we are fighting with this and here are the restaurants that are in support of us. Here's the other supporters that we have. So this is the way we control uh, the narrative, the frame, if it were. And this is uh, an op-ed. So, um, this is one that Howie did regarding the Green New Deal back in 2019. Um, and op-eds, again, is a way to get the cam your campaign out there to address an issue. This was in the uh, Gotham Gazette. Um, that's in New York, and this is a portion of it, but if you've seen any of Howie's work, you know, Howie does, you know, invoke some of the things I have talked about earlier about, like, framing and what have you, but what someone like Howie will do is, like, you know, how to address issues in a very succinct way, 
Um, in other words, you know, we can't belabor the point when it comes to a topic and what have you. So op-eds is that thing that that's very much in our control. There's a word limit for op-eds. And we also be very strategic in what op-eds we can place them at, especially if it's a statewide campaign. Is it better to place them in the Tribune and Sun Times? Or is it better to put it in the Pentagraph or in the Quad City Times or the Rockford Register? Again, these are I'm talking about statewide campaigns. Um, so forth and so forth. Um, and then briefly, um, interviews. This is George Oshenfeld. Many of us may know of him. Um, who fought the uh, Piatone Airport um, down there um, uh, over by Will County. And this is him preparing for an interview with a group called Stand that was fighting against Piatone Airport. Um, when, you're, when we're talking about interviews, you know, it's about three points. We're trying, what are the three things that we're trying to say? And we're repeating those three points. Um, we're also passionate when we're interviews. Like we're, we're passionate about these issues and we have to express that when we're talking to the interviewer, um, that first question is very important. The first question that you answer sets the tone of the entire interview. And if you do like fall flat on it, the interviewer is going to pick that up. And that may be a make or break point on how they write an article or how it's perceived on the television. Um, so that first question is very important. So take a moment before the interview, you know, think about the questions. You can ask for questions ahead of time too with the interviewer if they're apt to do it. Um, but if they're not, think about the questions they're going to be asking and then, you know, really think about what that first question is going to be and how you're going to deliver that. And remember, we have three audiences, our core supporters, the potential ones, and then the opposition supporters. And by the oppositional supporters, how are we trying to sway them? And when I say oppositional supporters, like they're on the fence, like they're for the opposition, but we can pick them off and join them on our side and everything and just remain calm. There are times that an interview could be um, not in our favor, um, it, particularly if it's a, uh, most media has an ideology, but if we nurse one have a much stronger ideology than most, um, they can be a little infuriating at times. Um, even the way questions asked could be infuriating at times. I've had my fair share of those. But at the end of the day, you just have to remain calm and answer the questions, stick to your points, and then just go from there. I'm done with my part. Okay. And if you want to unshare the screen so we can see each other easily again. Um, I didn't see any questions going along. Um, oh, here's, here's a question uh, from, from Allison. Yeah, I see that. Um, is there a particular writing style that these writings should be done in, in MLA format or, or et cetera? So oh, you answered her, but with flames. <laughs> no. <laughs> So if I can ask a question to you, Allison. So when you're talking about a writing style, you're talking about more like the essays, you're talking more what? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm like talking like APA, MLA, you know, like the, like the rules, you know, that you learn in university. Like is, so I can like cheat sheet this. So, I mean, and Charles kind of referenced it a little bit earlier, like there's mm -hmm. an actual media style also. Okay. I mean, there's, there's that. But I mean, if, if you were talking more like that way, stay with APA, American Psychological okay. Association style. Okay, that's what um, I figured. So that's oh, anything that's going to be a default. That anything that's going to okay. be a default is going to be APA. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, because like I'm writing. Mm. Right. I'm reading. So it's like if I have a little bit of a guy, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you great job. Well, like you. very succinct. Well, very looking you. forward to listening to this again. <laughs> um good job. 
Okay, I see Charles has his hand up. Yeah, I, I like your concept of framing. Uh, and I'm not certain if it relates. Uh, when I lobby Congress uh, for organizations we develop, we use called position papers, mm -hmm. one page position papers. And um, has the Green Party, I know we've got a platform someplace, <laughs> uh, but have we developed position papers um, for our top 10 issues uh, by any chance? Or do you think that's useful? I mean, if I was a reporter, I'd like to ask like, what are your, what are your top issues? And then you have a document ready a problem and a solution. I think you outlined it. Uh, and the other thing is, I keep asking the other third party out there, these libertarians, I always accuse them. I say, you guys haven't changed your your top 10 issues ever. <laughs> Are you ever going to come up with new position papers? It's been the same for decades. <laughs> Uh, and they never respond. Uh, but seriously, I wouldn't it be useful to focus your campaign around the most what you deem the most effective issues in your jurisdiction, uh, and have documents ready, the pro and con, and maybe some reference materials on it. Yeah. So. I'm gonna respond in two responses. So with platforms, yeah. When you're, if you're running a city race, a uh, statewide race, federal race, um, we have a platform and therefore, you know, trying to take that platform and succinct, succinctly try to convey that message, right? Um, if, if you've seen our platform, you know, it's kind of written in a very intellectual way and not a lot of folks are going to like understand some of these more conceptual stuff. So we have to like really break it down so that someone can understand, you know, like what a LaSalle tax is or what fracking is or pick your pick your topic and everything. So it does need to be drafted in a way so it's out there and people can understand it and then they're on board but to your question of position papers this is why i can't i get hesitant on that not hesitant because of the position papers there i hesitate because that is written for a particular audience um that's more of a academic um kind of audience uh that's a that's something i would write for the university club at university of chicago it's something i would write something for the um paul simon institute of policy in, in carbondale you know that's something i would do so folks can understand this and share it among amongst them and hopefully get some sort of support from them as well but just to write a position paper and put it out there no i mean what is if i write a position paper about whole foods developing more whole foods in the south side of chicago how's that going to help some folks in like inglewood roseland and woodlawn it's, it's it's not you know they'll i know folks when i live down there i mean will understand it but it's not going to be really helping anyone else except for i just hand it to a professor at university of chicago and they're like oh i get it that's it so you can do a position paper, but again, just remember that's for a particular audience and not for a general group. Yeah, I would say one of the Howie's campaign, Howie wrote a lot of position papers. Um, Howie's a policy wonk and it's what he does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of them like, you know, Medicare for all or police reform or the Green Eco Socialist Green New Deal got large position papers yeah. um others got you know smaller um but that i personally in terms of position papers where i think the green party needs 
one pagers most is internal education. Um, so that I, there's a lot of greens running out there talking about a green new deal, but can they differentiate what we mean versus what is meant when, the, when AOC and the Democrats say it? Because there's substantial differences, mainly public versus private investment, but um, and timelines, you know. But so I, I think it, where position papers I think are important at our current you know capacity in the Green Party is for internal education. Um, so that our membership and our candidates can go um, past a slogan, which is often a problem. Mm -hmm. Steve's back. That's all Steve. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Framing is very important. Uh, it saves a lot of time. Once you properly frame something, then uh, people know what you're talking about. It's also very useful in combating the other side's framing. For example, you know, um, a woman's right to choose didn't, wasn't finally successful until they came up with the idea of pro, the framing of pro-choice. And of course, on the other side, they got pro-life. And you always want to think about, so whenever you talk to the other side, you don't use their framing. You need, need to use your framing. And you would say they're anti-choice. You never fall into using the life word or the abortion word. You stay with your framing because it, it puts your side on the, on the best light. Uh, another great one is uh, um, gay marriage. That wasn't successful until they came up with equal marriage. And I would say we're not framing the issue that we call climate change properly. We know it's, it's a very well-known fact that the Republicans focus choice, because focus, focus grouping, doing focus groups is part of the whole framing thing. They get focus groups. They want to hear how people react to different framing techniques. And of course, the Republicans and I'm sure the Democrats spent a lot of money on that. And the Republicans famously focus grouped the term climate change and found that it was to their advantage to use that framing. And it just irritates the heck out of me that the left uses the rights framing on that issue. We should always call it global warming or I would say at some point we just call it mass extinction because that's where we're going. <laughs> um, but we, as, as long as we call it climate change, we're never gonna win the battle, in my opinion. Uh, another one is uh, the issue of single payer healthcare. Of course, that's a gobbledygook of words that we should never say uh, because nobody understands it or very few do. Uh, I think the best thing for the whole healthcare issue is just call it equal healthcare. It's short. You want these framing to be just a few syllables and everybody knows what you're talking about. And I think, you know, who can be against, you really shouldn't be against equal healthcare. I think you could argue against your opponent who is against it. Well, you're against equal healthcare. So I'll just leave it at that. But I think framing is very important. And yeah, we should probably, um, these ideas that that AJ is bringing forward, you know, we should maybe formalize a little more in the Illinois Green Party. We have a group that's working on framing on issues that are important to the Illinois Green Party, and also messaging. You know, great point about messaging, and stay on message. Mm -hmm. Over. Any other questions? And Chris, do you need to start soon because you have to leave? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just going to roll in. Um, so AJ talked about kind of the, you know, the, the theory behind what we want to be doing, though got into with like interviews, very detailed. Um, I'm going to get a, do a real quick kind of how um, the nuts and bolts of media and then roll into social media. Um, I shared a link on uh, in the chat that is based off of a local media guide that we made, um, myself and uh, Virginia uh, Rodino from Maryland. Um, but, you know, whether it's local papers or TV, 
um, podcasts, blogs, right? We've got to think about not just the mainstream media, but you know who runs the Facebook page in your in your community in the you know communities in your district that uh, you know cover these tor- these type of things. Um, but we got we use media to you know get our message out and to grow our audience. So um, Charles had asked about press lists press lists before. Um, the Illinois Green Party has one. It could definitely use updating, right? And that's something that's important to keep in mind about press lists is that they have to be ever evolving. They're living documents, right? Reporters go in and out. You've got to make sure you're updating. And if you if you sit on a press list for two years and don't update it, it's outdated. And a lot of those people um, might not be who you need to be contacting. Um, you can always buy them, right? There's Cision, probably. Um, I've, I've, there's a few options in that link. Um, so you can always buy them, but that's not necessarily um, within the, the scope of a lot of green parties. Um, you know, to, to do that, you don't just buy it, right? They're living lists. You buy a subscription that you have to keep updating. Um, and then the reality is those lists are only going to give you so much. So you're going to end up doing a good, a good amount of research and adding um, to your own. So you should always start with researching, you know, who do you want to reach? Who's your target audience? What outlets, journalists, influencers uh, can help you reach that. Um, what journalists are covering issues that you're going to be talking about. Um, because when you buy a decision list, you get every single person that works for your local paper, right? You then have to go through and, and they'll help you a little with tags, but not always horribly accurately. Um, but you'll need to be able to go in and say, you know, if I'm talking about education, I need to send it to this person. And if I'm talking about um, you know, climate, I need to send it to this person. And if I'm talking about labor, I need to send it to this person. Um, so you need to work that out. You should find these journalists on social media. Um, I, I'll, you know, when I talk about social media, I'll, I'll talk about how much I hate Twitter. Um, but one area it is really good is you can directly contact, you know, you can directly tag a journalist um, to make sure they see your content. Um, you want to collect a diverse, uh, you know, range of contact methods. You don't just want an email, right? You want a phone number. Um, you want that Twitter handle. You want a few ways to do it. Um, never stop building it, and you've got to keep it updated, right? Um, and so that's you know that's that's the basics of kind of building a list. Um, it can be as basic as putting it in a spreadsheet. Or you could have it in a, a contact management platform like Mailchimp or um, something like that, um, and that'll allow you to send it out. One benefit that you get from you know Mailchimp versus uh, trying to use your normal email is that uh, if you try to send email, an email to 50 people out of your Google account, uh, Google's going to send that straight to spam. Um, whereas you know, companies like MailChimp or Constant Contact who have free plans that are totally within the range of most, uh, you know, local campaigns or even state, you know, a state rep campaign, I don't think would necessarily go over the need. I think you get 2,000 contacts on MailChimp, right? So that's a lot. Um, so you can use those and they actually work with the, uh, you know, email providers to make sure that their stuff isn't getting sent to spam as much. Um, you know. A big key on whether or not you get covered is whether or not have a re- whether or not you have a relationship. Um, you know, remember, journalists are human beings. They're trying to do jobs. Um, they're trying to do their job. Make sure your contacts are personal, right? If all they ever get from you is a, is a mass email, they're way less likely to come out, as opposed to um, you know doing a little more personal outreach. Um, be newsworthy make sure that you you know only contact them about newsworthy things don't just fill their inbox right that that gets you into like the, the boy who cried wolf situation right if, if you send them 10 things that are frankly boring um you'd like them covered but you know they're not appealing to a journalist and then by the 11th one when you actually have something that they might want to cover they're ignoring your emails at that point right you're just spam to them um a really good thing to also remember, especially with um, kind of the destruction that's happening in the media um, realm, is 
as it becomes more and more and more centralized under a few companies. Um, at least through, you know, I'm in the state capital and our, we don't have reporters for a lot of things anymore. Like our, our local newspaper is mostly sourced out of AP and Reuters, right? Um, and so a lot of times when you do an event, a reporter doesn't show up. Who shows up is a videographer or a photographer. Um, and at least in my market, uh, having a good relationship to, with that with the camera person that shows up means that they made sure that we actually got on, right? Um, when Chelsea Manning um, was released, we did a, a little rally at our in front of the old state capitol in Springfield. And the only person that showed up for you know from the press was the local TV station's camera person. And we were on the five o'clock news that night. And because he was there and he was the one asking questions and he was on our side, he's always been, you know, on our side at these types of things. I got to talk about imperialism on the news. Um, I got to say the word imperialism on U.S. news, right? And so um, that same cameraman has come out to minimum wage rallies and worked with us to frame the shot in front of where we were protesting in a way that it looked like we had more people than we did. Because if we raised the minimum wage, he was going to get a raise. Right. So um, a lot of times getting to know, you know, the camera people, the photographer, you know, the newspapers will, at least in Springfield, are notorious for just sending a photographer and they take a few notes and then they like look at what other people covered and they put it all together. Uh, the photography is really the only, um, you know, original thing that newspapers creating the rest. They're just, you know, stealing from other people. Um, so getting to know those people can, can be a really good outlet. Um, and the same goes for reporters, right? You build a relationship with a reporter, all of a sudden they're going to show up whenever you want. Um, during Occupy, when we, in Springfield, we became the first Occupy cell to drop a banner inside of a chamber. Um, and we dropped a banner inside the house chamber. And, you know, we're doing it and I'm calling my friend who worked at NPR and I said, you know, you need to be at the house chambers at this time. And she said, why? And I said, I can't tell you. Well, we had a relationship enough that I could say, you just need to be there, right? And she listened. Um, if you don't have a relationship, they're going to blow you off. So um, there's that. In here, in, in the, you know, the, to finish up this real quick how side, um, in here we've got some resources at the bottom um, that have things like sample press releases, sam sample advisories. Um, and one important thing is, you know, so you're doing an event, right? You send your media advisory and none of the press shows up. You need to engage in self-coverage. You need to take pictures. You need to take video. You need to write a blog post about the event that you had that day. You need to share that content via your social media platforms, via your email lists, that kind of thing. Um, and then send a follow-up to the press, right? Send something that says, we did this. The, you know, don't get mad at them. Don't say you didn't show up, but we did this. Send a positive, you know, people oriented look at what we did. And it may get covered, right? They didn't show up. And maybe if you sent it and they blew you off, but they, they keep seeing that you are putting on good newsworthy events, then they're gonna they're gonna follow up, right? And it's a way to say you're you know, you're not just um, spamming them. Um, so that's just a real quick, you know, nuts and bolts on it. Um, that link that I put in the chat has a video with of Virginia doing part of a workshop on it and everything and, and lots of links. But um, I, AJ did an awesome job with the, the uh, you know, the kind of big picture philosophy on it. And I wanted to hit a couple of those nuts and bolts things to make sure that you know, people knew. So I mentioned earlier, right, there's the old media, there's TV, there's radio, there's newspapers, um, and then you know, and each one of them has their varying, you know, levels, right? Like um, your local paper, might your local daily might not be friendly to you, but your uh, your local your weekly, you know, arts reader might be. Um, so you you need to you know think about who are you trying to reach, who's going to write, who's writing about the things that you want to you want to talk about, and the same thing goes for other digital platforms, right? Um, is there somebody that does a podcast on your town? You know, is there somebody that does a podcast on an issue? 
um, that's from your that lives within your district? Is there a blogger that um, that reaches people? Is there, you know, I I, I remember I was talking you know, on an organizing call, you know, and a lot of neighbor in communities kind of died a lot of places, right? We don't know our neighbors, but you go into a lot of working class communities and it's still there. Um, and there, I remember when I was working as a, as a community organizer, um, you very quickly in some neighborhoods could identify the one person in that neighborhood that could get your message out, right? Like the block mom, right? And so that's somebody, you know, finding out who those people are. And, you know, I think in traditional terms, we tend to think of committee people and things like that in, in the political realm of being those people. And sometimes they are, but a lot of, you know, especially in working class communities, um, that's our non-voters where they've decided that they're not going to participate in choosing an oppressor, right? They're tired of politics as usual and they rationally, you know, for better or worse, it's a rational decision for them to walk away. Um, and so in those neighborhoods, it doesn't matter who the precinct committeeman for the Democratic Party is. The Democratic Party is not representing the neighborhood and the people aren't turning out to vote for them. So they're not a very good precinct committee person. You need to find the block mom, right? You need to find the, the, the elder or the, the, you know, the extrovert of the block that can bring people together and talk to people and get people to show up. Um, so when we talk about media these days, we're not just talking about sending out a press release, right? We're talking about connecting to the right people, you know, hitting the neighborhood um, associations are another example that are very hit and miss, right? Some are great, some are non-existent, um, but they can get you into the right, to the movers and shakers in the individual neighborhood. Um, so we've got to expand how that, you know, how we think about media and that includes obviously social media. Um, I think every time I talk about social media, the same as when I talk about systems, I really have to constantly hammer in a point. Social media is not a replacement for on the ground organizing, right? It's social media is a tool that can give us access to new potential supporters. It can allow for efficient communication and engagement with current supporters, but social media alone is essentially useless. Um, if it's not plugged into a serious real world campaign, um, then you're, it's not plugged into anything real and um, it's just kind of going off into a void. So, you know, just to repeat it again, social media is an organizing tool, not a orga not organizing in and of itself. Um, and a big reason for this is the level of organizing that social media allows is basically creating a voter, right? Someone can see what you post and say, oh, I like that. And that's about where it ends. And you hope that they show up on election day. Um, you know, and, and, and a voter is useful, but it, and especially in the context of a campaign, but since we're also a party, you know, a voter is only useful every once every year or two. Um, even if they're a consistent voter, they're not, uh, being a voter isn't growing our party. Um, being a voter isn't, isn't growing your campaign. Um, because without an organizing and onboarding component accompanying it, social media is just one direction, right? We say things out and yes, people can comment and you know, a good social media campaign is active in replying and active in, in funneling people towards ways that they can get actively involved, but the social media in and of itself, if you just make the post, it's one directional. Um, and that means it's very different. So it's very difficult to advance someone to a supporter, from a voter to a supporter, to an organizer, to a leader in your campaign. Um, you know, a little ladder organizing there. But to do that, you have to have sustained contact. You need relationship building. You need an actual operation for them to move into, right? Um, it's one big problem that Greens have is they say, come to our next meeting. And the person shows up and says, what do I do? And they're like, oh, I don't know. We just had a meeting. You know, we need to have tangible ways um, you know, even within this part, in, within the Illinois Green Party, uh, people involved in the CC and exec over the last few years might remember when I moved to secretary, I did so explicitly because I wanted a more defined job. Because I thought that the chair position was too vague and abstract and nebulous, and there was too much to do to focus on. Um, whereas, you know, the, the secretary was much clearer. So we need that, you know, we need that when we bring people in. Um, 
So social media, obviously, as I said, has some shortcomings, right? And that's why it's not in and of itself organizing an answer. Um, so why do we use social media? We use it to reach our supporters. We use it to reach new people. We use it to spread our message um, and you know, promote events. We use it to raise money. We use it to bring in contacts and volunteers. And one thing I do want to say you know, is when I, since I just said raise money is we use it to raise money. Um, 10 to 20% of your posts should on social media should be direct money asks as a, um, as a campaign, um, you know, because campaigns are finite. They have a, a starting date and an ending date and you need the funding within that period. Um, you know, and that's not just, you know, generic, give us money, you know, it's, $15 Friday, um, Anna did something a few months ago where, uh, you know, I made graphics and we had a, um, we had some social media campaigns and it was, I don't remember the numbers, but it was like, donate 2386 to support ballot access equality because that was the bill number of a ballot access equality bill, right? Um, so you can get creative with things like that. You can, um, you know, do giveaways, you know, uh, you know, an example would be one, you know, we'll randomly pick one donor this month and they'll get a free t-shirt or they'll get a copy of this book, right? Um, so you're asking for that. And the, one of the good things about someone giving you their money is then you get their contact information, right? If you can take some, if you can get a donor from social media, they don't have that one problem, that one directional problem, um, right? Because now you've got their email address because you got it when they paid you. And now you can follow up and you can get your touches, um, right? I think it's seven, seven or nine touches arbitrarily are set. It's said that you need to, you know, contact a voter that many times to turn them into a voter for you, like somebody that will actually show up. Um, so, you know, we should be using our social media to push out relevant news, commentary, political positions. This gets into a lot of the different stuff that you know, AJ was talking about. Um, you know, social media is kind of like just another, um, you know, media platform, but we control it. Um, it has a limited audience and we control it, right? So anything you're putting out, and, and kind of with Alice, when Allison X asked about, um, you know, styles, while we can write in certain styles, the reality is for us as Green, most of our stuff is self-promotion, right? So we put out a press release that we sent to the media but most of the play that that press release is probably going to get is when we share what we had to say on social media. So, you know, when we're doing this stuff, it's also important that we make sure we're formatting it in a way or ready to double format um, in a way that it will display and work well on, uh, you know, on a, on a website or shared via social media. So that means instead of, you know, having work cited page and stuff that you would have in an academic paper you link directly in the text like in, a, like in an article um you know we want to promote events and content um and collect new contacts because it like i said it doesn't provide a future way to contact and we need that um we need to campaigns that need to constantly try to reconnect with voters we have to find ways to get contact Right, and Greens are generally very uncomfortable with this. Um, but the reality is, we don't have the base big enough to just win an election, right? Um, so that means we need to be expanding our base. We need to be casting a wider net. Um, we need to be bringing contacts into our lists um, that that we don't have. And so this is where things like petitions, surveys, mock rank choice votes. Um, are ways that we can collect contact information from people on social media, which will then allow us to engage them other ways. Then they then they start getting our email blasts. Then they start them that we can start phone banking. Then we can send Steve's dreaded robocall, right? And um, we can we can knock their door in canvassing, which is a, a, a really powerful way that you can try to reach a voter, right? Um, and so Greens are really uncomfortable with this idea, but the reality is when you see an online petition, it doesn't get turned in, it doesn't get sent to anyone. It's a data harvesting tool. Um, it's what it's for. It's to get contacts and, you know, and hopefully in, a, in an ideal world, 
um, you're going to get followed up by an organization that you support um, about an issue that you want to be active on, right? So then if you look at it that way, it's not malicious. Um, but the reality of the functionality of these things is that, um, you know, you say take our take our survey on what your top issue is this election, and they go and it asks them for their name, their email, their phone number, and their answers. Um, and you got it, you know. And so, I we did a lot of those surveys during and petitions during Howie's campaign. Um, I'll say I always dug into the data. Um, I always shared analysis of the data. Um, and frankly, since I was talking about issues surveys, we probably did a half a dozen of them over the course of the campaign. And the data showed that Greens are right. We're campaigning on the right issues. Climate and healthcare are all, when we asked for people's top three issues, pretty much every single survey we did over the course of four years has shown that people care about climate and healthcare between and between 67 and 75 percent of the people who put vote put, want to put them in their top three right so it's a huge issue um and then when we kept going down the list what you know we were we were right and on the on point with the, you know with our base at least on all these issues so um but it helps you take you know your facebook reach um you know, you, you say you have this many thousand followers on Facebook, well, you can, can you actually reach them all? So part of a social media manager's job is to slow, to, to as best as possible, get the con direct contact information for all of those, um, you know, all of your followers. Uh, and you're, it's not going to be successful to be 100%, but um, that's one of the ways you can do it. And, uh, you know, I will say Bernie Sanders' campaign was pretty successful in, message organizing right where they i don't know how they did it um i'd be interested in knowing but in my mind you just you'd watch and every person that liked your post you'd put their facebook url into a um a google uh like in a, into a spreadsheet and your volunteers would click it and they would directly message people to talk about the campaign um so there is a way but that way is incredibly labor intensive Right, you have to be tracking and reporting everybody who's who's interacting with you on social media, um, and then you need to um, have the the volunteer team that can go and manually have one on ones. Um, you know, a one on one is the best conversation you can have, whether digitally or in person. But a one on one is also the most resource intensive um, thing you can have. So, you know, the big thing you're, that we're trying to do on social media, though is you know the, like i said reach our supporters right um communicate what, what's going on promoting events um putting out statements um and there's a there's a lot of crossover between reaching supporters and reaching new people on social media right because they're all kind of lumped into the same basket um we're trying to spread our message in our events we're trying to raise money we're trying to bring in new contacts and volunteers, right? So in addition to asking for money, you should also be you know, consistently advertising um, volunteer opportunities and things like that. On Facebook, they actually have jobs. I don't know if you can, I'm sure you can list the volunteer position as a job. I've never tried, but I'm sure you can set the wage to zero. Um, but that, you know, that's a way you can do it on Facebook too. Um, that is kind of built into their system. So content, right? I, what should we be doing and how? Original content is best, but don't be afraid of curating content from other sources, right? Um, you go to the Green Party page, you go to Howie's page, things like that. You can get, um, you know, you can get regular content that you can share and then put your own commentary on. Um, Sharing current events, news stories uh, with commentary in, the ca in, in a caption is a very good way for a campaign to keep regular posting up, right? Because a key thing for growing your social media organically is um, regular posting. I mean, every single day you have to make posts. Um, Facebook in particular will punish you if you miss a day. It'll punish you more if you miss two, and it will punish you more if you miss three. Um, 
right? So the, the key on, on, you know, developing organic growth is consistent quality content. Um, you need to be, you know, sh so sharing that current events is one way that can kind of alleviate it, right? You don't need a new graphic today necessarily. If there's a news event from yesterday, you want to talk about it, put commentary on it. And the faster that you can get this content out, um, the better. Um, the earlier that you can have the, you can have your word in, the better, especially on Twitter. Like it, on Twitter, if you can be one of the first comments on a news story in the thread, and if you say something that resonates, you'll stay there, right? Because you'll have that early in where people will start liking and retweeting you. And then as if you stay popular, um, so you get the one up on being popular, basically. And Twitter, Twitter will keep those top replies up at the top. And it's just a, and then we'll get into platforms in a minute. Who knows how Twitter will work in the Musk era, but you know. Um, so we wanna be putting out that content. Um, image is better than uh, having an image with your post is better than text. Posting video is better than an image and live stream is the best thing that they wanna see. Um, to that end, one thing I wanna say, you know, like a, at the beginning of this, right? Everyone heard the recording has started. I, I preach all the time, you should never do an event without recording it and uploading it. Um, if you can, live stream it, right? Um, and that's, again, just because of algorithms, right? The algorithms love a live stream. Um, so if you, have a, if you speak at a rally, record it, live stream it while you're speaking. Um, if you, and, and the Illinois Green Party can get you, you know, get, get campaigns hooked up with, with um, StreamYard, so you can do that also free to multiple platforms. Um, if you do a town hall, record it, right? Um, people shouldn't be restricted to seeing you and hearing your positions because they can't be at a specific place at a specific time, right? I, I, the amount of amazing quality content that no one will ever know about, even within just the Illinois Green Party is probably pretty astounding, right? Because there's just no record. Um, somebody did something really good and it's just not there. Um, you, don't, you don't have a recording. And so it's, if you weren't there, you don't get it. Um, to, to touch on what Steve was saying with ads, um, Steve is right. With campaigns, it is a little different um, because like I said earlier, you know, you're finite, um, you're gonna end. Um, even if you run again, there's going to be a break before you run again. And unless you are a, a sucker like me who's continued running Howie's campaign on a daily basis, social media on a daily basis for a year and a half at this point, you're probably going to let your social media die off and then you're going to get hit anyway, right? So um, coming up to election day as a campaign, if you've got the money to dump into ads, dump them into ads, right? destroy your organic reach because the day after election day it's probably not going to matter if you reach anybody um so there is that you know i will give my normal warning right the way that especially on facebook that ads work and twitter i think has the best policy no political ads um you shouldn't be paying for access politically um who knows with musk will continue that but um on facebook where ads are most prevalent um you know, the general, we don't know how their algorithm works exactly. No one's allowed to see it. Um, but what we do know are things like uh, the number of likes your page have, your page has is a vanity stat. It doesn't, it doesn't go into reach at all. Um, to that point, people often like to, you know, create their campaign page and then share it to everyone they know, right? I get green invites to like green pages and, and different left, you know, organization pages from around the country that I have no access to that I'm, I'm thousands of miles away from. And that's because they just want to bump up their number, right? They want to bump up that vanity stat. But the reality is if you've got a thousand followers and 700 of them aren't near you, it's going to be really hard for you to reach the 300 who are. Because if you've got a thousand followers, Facebook's only going to let you reach 500 per post anyway, and I'm making these numbers up. But so now you've cut down the number, your total reach, and most of that's going to go to the people who aren't actually local to you. So you want to make sure, you know, while a little bit of padding those stats is fine, um, you really want to make sure that the people following you on social media are the people you want to be speaking to, and not just 
this, you know, the social media noise. Um, so there's that side of it, but with ads, what they do is they look at your previous posts. So if you made a post and it reached a thousand people, they'll expect your next post to reach a thousand people. If it reaches 1500 people, your next post will go to 1200 before they cap you, before they throttle you. If you reach 500, it'll go to seven from a thousand, right? Um, and so how ads work is they take your thousand and they make it 2000. So your next post, Facebook expects you to reach 2000 people without an ad, which you can't, most people can't do, um, which then they go, oh, you dropped a lot. You only got to 500. Now you're all of a sudden down to 700 people um, instead of a thousand or down to 500. Um, and my example for this is always when I did a podcast um, in 2016. Um, in 2015 and 2016, we interviewed, interviewed Jill Stein. Um, you know, we were reaching about 3,500 people the day we posted the episode and we decided to boost it. We got another thousand. We'd used to reach 1,500 people an episode. So that 3,500 was already pulling us up, right? We were, it was going to make our next post, our next post really good. Um, but because we paid for that ad and it pulled us up to about 4,800, all of a sudden, when our next post reached three, they tanked us. Um, and it took us about three months to build back to that 1500. Um, so, you know, for that one post, we paid for it for, thir for three months. So, and, and another area where I think ads make sense is events, right? Um, if you're gonna do something and you wanna turn people out, ads can work. The thing we've gotta remember when it comes to social media events, is that I tell people expect 10% of those who say they are coming to come. Um, I have another friend who says a quarter and I think they're too generous, right? So if 100 people are say on Facebook, they're gonna to come to your event, unless you are really doing turnout, right? And calling and contacting those people, expect 10 of them. Um, you know, that the, there's not a very good um, return on that kind of stuff. Um, to wrap up real quick and look at each different, some different platforms, you need to be everywhere you have the capacity to be um, in terms of platform. Different people use different platforms to get their information. So you need to be as many, in as many spaces as your capacity allows. The reason I'm talking about capacity is if you have a Twitch, but you never use it, what's the point of having it? If you start a Discord, but you aren't there to engage in the discussion, you've lost control of that space. Um, you know, if you have a Twitter, but you don't use it, um, that looks actually negatively on your campaign, right? Just having it um, isn't enough. You have to be effectively using it. Um, so, you know, to run through some platforms really quick, Facebook, more so than most platforms, and there's a lot of bad things about Facebook, um, but more than most platforms, what, one thing that it has is local contacts, right? Facebook's where you're friends with people in your neighborhood. Facebook's where you're friends with people from your high school. Facebook's where you're friends with people in your community. Twitter's where you're friends with the random people that you meet in flame wars, right? Um, but Facebook is one of those platforms where people still have that local connection, which is important for a campaign. It means that if you, turn someone into an active supporter on Facebook that their posts are getting to people that are within your range. Um, if some random lefty on Twitter decides to start promoting your campaign um, or some random green across the country, it's probably not going to affect much. Um, so there is that positive on Facebook. Um, for Facebook, for most campaigns and parties, two to three times per day posting, one is fine. Make sure you get the one. Um, for a campaign, you can probably go up to five or seven uh, times a day, but you have, like I said, you have to post every day. And with the campaign, it can definitely rise and fall, right? When you're promoting things, like it, when I when I have a um, when I have an event, a live stream going on, you'll usually see either in the morning or right at noon of that day, you know, event tonight, 7 p.m. and the graphic and everything. And then an hour before, starting in an hour, and sometimes it will even be starting now. Um, but I'll, I'll promote the same thing multiple times, um, trying to get different people. So two to three times a day, um, you know, up to five to seven probably for a campaign. If you post too much on Facebook, 
they will start throttling you. Uh, their algorithm will get mad. Um, for Twitter, like I said, who knows in the post in the Musk Twitter world what it'll be like. Um, I call it the most American of social media platforms. Um, its character limit makes it difficult to convey complex ideas, and it lends itself to a culture of the loudest person wins, um, which is right down Musk's alley. Um, but on the other hand, it's the best place to respond to current events and to make commentary. Um, the key on Twitter is if you're going to be active, you need to have someone who can reply almost constantly. So you need to have a team, right? Um, to, to do Twitter well, you have to respond to the people um, who are who are fighting with you, basically, because that's mostly what Twitter seems to be for nowadays, is fighting with people. Um, on Twitter, there's really not a limit to how much you can tweet. Um, this algorithm's not going to punish you, but make sure you have a reason for tweeting. Um, Make, you know, we all thought Trump looked crazy when he was treating, tweeting at 3 a.m., right? Remember that, right? If you were tweeting, you know, random policy ideas at 3 a.m., it's going to have the same, you know, interpretation most from most of the public as it did when Trump did. Um, so, you know, it is a full-time job, Allison. Uh, social media directors are multi, multiple full-time jobs. Um, Instagram, aesthetic first platform. Right, uh, they do limited videos and do live streams, uh, but they're, the post it's all about the picture, right? They don't allow links. They're they're heavy on hashtags, um, one plus a day, right? But it doesn't have the same kind of punishment as Facebook. Um, Instagram is one of those those things. You know, when you're sharing, you go you need to say, you know, is this worth putting up there? Uh, because it's not a platform for noise. It's a platform for quality. Um, you know, and like I said, you can live stream on it. One problem with live streaming on Instagram is that they don't let you connect it to other things, right? So when we do the Illinois Green Party series every Monday, it goes to Facebook, it goes to, um, it goes to YouTube. When Howie does his weekly live stream, it goes to Facebook, it goes to YouTube, it goes to Twitter, and it goes to Twitch. Um, Instagram won't let itself be plugged into those systems. So you either have to do it on Instagram or do it on others. Um, as I just said, YouTube. So YouTube um, has become its own social media platform. Um, in a way, it's very powerful for political ideas and discussions. Um, so, you know, you should definitely be doing videos or, you know, recording things, putting them up, doing short videos on your policies, um, stuff like that. And get, you know, having a robust YouTube channel is a good place to, um, to gain to gain supporters and especially in the case with um, if you do a live stream putting it up there will gain you you know actual fans uh, how his live stream has the same you know has a, a core group that's there every week um, to see it um I, I mentioned twitch earlier too twitch is mostly a gaming platform but it's good for live streams right so uh, that's one area where we did break the rule of not just having a platform for the sake of having it. Um, we do just have a Twitch and we've never done anything with it, but send live streams to it with the Howie campaign. So, you know, if you've got the capacity, it's some, it's another platform and it's generally a way younger audience. Um, I said, I, I didn't say it with Instagram, but Instagram tends to be a younger audience than Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'll address TikTok real quick. Um, short videos only. Right, and an even younger platform. Um, so I would not recommend to a campaign that doesn't have an idea of what they're going to do on TikTok to jump on TikTok. That's going to get you made fun of on TikTok. Um, you know what you want to be. You 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 want to find someone who can put out you know quality content, compressed content, right? Because it's got to be short, um, and it, it's got to be engaging. So that's somewhere where you you know I definitely wouldn't just jump right in. Um, I would highly recommend to close that people look at something like Hootsuite, which got expensive lately, and I hate that it did. Um, it used to be my go-to suggestion, but um, it got pretty expensive, but a, a decent campaign can easily afford it. Um, there's other systems like Later or Buffer that have free versions that might work, but using a scheduling app is what makes consistent posting possible, right? If you have to remember to go do it every day, you're going to forget, you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to miss a day. Um, it all, the scheduling app also helps you, you know, think out of what you should be talking about, put, to, put together a message calendar and things like that. So, 
Um, yeah. And that's all I have on social media, if there's any questions. Can I see people? I mean, I've got any a guess. questions for Chris? Oh, and I've got a guest. Okay. <laughs> Say hi. Hi, River. <laughs> hi. What's his name? River. River. Yeah. Steve Stack. Yes, yeah, Steve. I just gave you a couple fundraising um, ideas that worked the best for us uh, during the Wade campaign. Uh, Nancy Wade for Congress. Um, we had a, a fundraiser where we auctioned off the candidate to have lunch with somebody. And then she, I, uh, we auctioned off uh, doing karaoke maybe with the campaign manager. So we did just things like that. And people got into it. They were bidding it up. We ended up uh, getting, you know, an several hundred dollars uh, doing that kind of stuff the, and then what the other best Sorry. the best social media fundraising i've seen out of the young equal socialist the youth caucus was years ago actually when allison was on the steering committee but their media chair would do weekly live streams and just give you know hey i'm going to be here for anywhere from five to 30 minutes giving an update on what's happening in the caucus and he would always say and if we raise a hundred dollars by the end of the stream i'll sing this song <laughs> and I'll be multiple times his mother donated money to make sure that he embarrassed himself, right? Um, but it he almost always made his money, right? So you cannot underestimate embarrassing yourself on the internet as a, a fundraising tool. <laughs> and then the one other pretty successful fundraiser, we had it in a bar and um, we... I literally passed the hat. I took the hat off my head and I, I didn't just pass it though. I walked around to each person, looked them in the eye and said, can you give a contribution? And I don't know, a lot of people gave a contribution that day. So um, <laughs> there's a couple ideas. Yeah, one thing I did forget to mention was that, um, you know, I, I talked to, I meant to talk about it during live streams, um, but like, it all depends on the candidate, right? Um, but if you have the right candidate or the right team member um, that can go on for a minute, two minutes, and just like, hey, everybody, and cheerlead, um, you know, that kind of stuff is really, you know, it gets you reach, it gets you attention. Um, it can, it's a great for promoting things, you know, and coming up and, and keeping people in, in there. And then it gives you those opportunities, right? Because Facebook and, and, and um, all, you know, YouTube will send people notifications the second you go live. And now all of a sudden at the end of it, and don't forget to donate, and don't, you know, it gives you that access to make your direct, direct asks. And you should always add those that, you know, at, at a minimum, there should always be an email button, right? Or a, a link. So.